Now, believe it or not, there are some Twitter accounts out there that are worth following. Stuff that can make you laugh, stuff that can make you smile, or stuff that will make you just go, hmm, never knew that. Stuff like Fessol, The State of LinkedIn, and QI. But one that I always look forward to looking at every morning when I get up is stuff from Matt Bishop. He's the former editor of F1 Racing Magazine. He's a former PR guy at Aston Martin and also McLaren, and he's just an all-round lovely bloke and he's always got stuff to to show you that's just really interesting if you're not following matt on twitter link is in the description matt is a repository for stats facts and trivia from the motorsport world and highlights people you've never heard of today he's celebrating the birthday of cliff allison yesterday he tweeted about tony rolt who won the 1953 24 hours of le mans whilst absolutely mortal drunk and also yesterday he posted an on this day about the 1981 south african grand prix which then sparked off a discussion about racing's nearly men or the what ifs the ones who got to the precipice of the zenith of racing immortality but through no fault of their own or just sheer bad luck or circumstance they never got to be the top they never got to be champion they never reached their full potential and that's where this video comes in I'm going to be looking at the nearly men and the what if men of racing and why they never got to where they should have been. So yeah, this is pretty much a list video, my second least favourite type of content after reaction videos. So with that said, I'm Rebecca from Watch Mojo, and here are some F1 drivers that never reached the top. F1's nearly men, F1's what ifs. Yeah, this also isn't a complete list, so if people are going to comment you forgot or what about, Honourable mentions go out to Wolfgang von Tripps, Philippe Massa, Mark Webber and Chris Amon. So the first driver under my little magnifying glass is Carlos Reutemann. And we'll kick things off with Matt's tweet because this is a motorsport fact I didn't realise. You might have seen my little mini-series last year where I talked about the major battles of the Fisa Foca War and how it was all part of Bernie taking control and how he and Max Mosley managed to fight hard against what we now know as the FIA. The battles raged on because of the way Foca wanted all the privateer teams such as Williams and Lotus and McLaren and Brabham to be treated and held in the same regard as the likes of Ferrari, Alfa, Renault and so on when it came to the handing out of money, as they felt the whole sport was biased to the manufacturers when it was these privateers that kept the grid full. Basically what had happened was that FISA had changed the date of the Grand Prix in South Africa to be on the 7th of February 1981, which the race organisers could not operate around. So instead of the race being a Formula 1 World Championship event, it was run as a Formula Libre event, where the teams could put on all the stuff that was illegal under F1 rules, such as side skirts. While all the FOCA teams entered, the manufacturer teams, so Ferrari, Alfa and Renault, along with Ligier and Asala, did not compete, meaning that the entire grid was powered by the mythical Cosworth DFV. Now Reutemann won this race, but this is where the twist takes place. If this race had been run to Formula 1 World Championship rules, even without the boycotting teams because 19 cars started, Reutemann, and not PK, would have been the 1981 World Champion. Reutemann lost the title to PK by just one point, having been overtaken during the final Grand Prix, and it was the closest he would ever get to being World Champion. Now, as a bonus fact, he would finish third three times in three different teams. That's a stat right there. Next up we've got Sterling Moss, and Sterling Moss is often regarded as being the greatest driver to never win the World Championship. For a time he had the most wins without a championship until Mansell overtook his win tally, but then obviously Mansell won the 1992 world title so Moss got that statistic back. Moss was one of those drivers who competed in virtually everything back in the day. Formula 1, Le Mans, Targa Florio, Mille Miglia, you name it. Moss raced at the same time as Peter Collins, Fanjo, Mike Hawthorne, and was present as the new breed were entering. Brabham, Graham Hill, Von Tripps, Joe Bonnier, and so on. So by 1958, the time he could have won the championship, there was this sort of overlap between old and new happening. In a way, it's... it's quite hard to explain. But anyway, the battle for the title was Moss in his van wall and Hawthorne in his Ferrari. And at the championship deciding race, Hawthorne was deemed to have reversed on the track after spinning and stalling. Moss stopped his car, shouted instructions at Hawthorne to turn his car around and bump start it on what would have been the downhill gradient. Hawthorne got the car going again and carried on. And when Moss explained this to the stewards after the race, Hawthorne was given the six points he needed to win in the title. 
Hawthorne would be killed at the start of 1959 in a car accident that was thought to be because of illegal street racing, and while he was participating in an illegal street race, it's thought that the actual accident was caused by him going into full kidney failure. He had a long-standing kidney issue that was the reason he retired from Formula 1 in the first place. Moss, on the other hand, had to retire early 1962 after a crash at Goodwood ended his career, and he would never become Formula 1 world champion. But in the period 1955 to 1958, Moss would finish second in all four of those seasons. Third up, we've got Gilles Villeneuve. Regarded as one of the finest naturally gifted Formula 1 drivers ever, Gilles Villeneuve is definitely one of those what-if drivers. The father of IndyCar champion, Indy 500 winner, Formula 1 world champion and musician, Jacques, Gilles was hotly touted as being a world champion and could have been Ferrari's next Nicky Lauda. He was rapid and had the backing of Enzo Ferrari himself. Some say that Gilles was one of, if not his actual favourite driver. Enzo showed leniency towards Villeneuve that he wouldn't have shown to anybody else. Villeneuve crashed his Ferrari and caused a pileup at Silverstone in 1981. Now normally Enzo would be raging that someone had crashed his beloved red car through not being careful, but instead he blamed the chicane that was at Woodcut at the time. Completely different to when Eugenio Castellotti was killed in a Ferrari in 1957 and Enzo was more worried about the state of the car than he was the fact his driver was dead. Jeremy Clarkson is on record as being a massive Gilles Villeneuve fanboy as well. Now Villeneuve's potential as a world champion was shown in the 1979 French Grand Prix. This wasn't even a battle for the lead, this was the battle for second, and Gilles and René Arnoux were going at it for several laps, driving their open wheel F1 cars like we think the BTCC was in the 90s and kicking seven colours of shit out of each other. It's a battle so iconic that you have to be reminded constantly that this was the race won by the recently departed Jean-Pierre Jabouin, and also the first win for a Renault engine and a turbo engine in Formula 1. Villeneuve would then be killed during qualifying for the 1982 Belgian Grand Prix at Zolder, and the year was supposed to be between Villeneuve and Pirani for the title because the Ferrari was much more reliable than the Renaults. But the two had had a falling out, well at least Villeneuve had fallen out with Peroni because he believed that Peroni had taken matters into his own hands at Imola the previous race so that he could win, Peroni that is, and it's thought that Villeneuve was still very much upset by this when he got to Zolder. What happened was Villeneuve came up on Jochen Mass and moved to the right to overtake him as Mass made the same move to the right to go offline, thinking that Villeneuve was going that way. Villeneuve hit Mass, got ejected from his car and ended up in the catch fencing where he died of a broken neck. This crash and two others that year led to the banning of ground effect for 1983, and the FIA also put limits on the super sticky qualifying tyres that had led to drivers taking more risks for a pole lap. The championship that year would be won by Keke Rosberg who only won one race all season, as Pironi would also suffer a career ending crash in what was basically a carbon copy of Villeneuve's just in the wet. Keeping things in the 1980s here, we're now going to look at Stefan Berloff. Now last week I did a video on Berloff and that immortal lap he set at the Nordschleife, the 611 pole lap for the Nürburgring 1000 kilometers. A lap that will never be repeated because nothing that fast races on the Nordschleife anymore. And it was a lap that got completely undone during the race because, well Berloff was a bit like Colin McRae. He didn't know what slow down meant. In the race, Beloff was determined to pull a lead back out on the guys behind when he took over from Derek Bell, and the mechanic said to him to not go through Flats Garden flat out because the setup won't allow it, at least on high fuel. Beloff must have thought he knew something they didn't and attempted to go flat through that corner, now called the Beloff S. Basically, he crashed and hit the outside wall at 140 miles an hour. The following year in 1984, Beloff was driving for Tyrrell in Formula 1, the only non-turbocharged car on the grid, and at the very, 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 very wet Monaco Grand Prix, he'd started dead last and had clawed his way back up to third, because he was able to keep the power down on the wet track, and also because, well, people were falling off in front of him. At the front of the field ahead of him was the McLaren of Alain Prost, a far superior car, and also some other rookie driver called... Senna, I think, who was driving a Tolman. Senna was chasing down Prost, and Senna gets all the column inches because it was an uncompetitive car chasing the faster car down and closing in, although Prost was having an engine misfire and also had some brake issues that might have helped Senna's cause a little bit. Something I didn't know until I put together this script. 
But what often gets overlooked here, either because Sen attacks or other reasons, is that Belloff was closing in on Senna faster than Senna was closing in on Prost. Now the race was abandoned due to the weather and some think that if the race had run its full course, Senna would have passed Prost and gone on to win the race. But it later transpired that Senna had absolutely clattered the curbs at the harbour front chicane and that suspension was damaged to the point where it was about to collapse. So at the same time, well, would Beloff have caught them both and passed them both if the race had continued on with the pace he had? And obviously Senna had suspension that was about to collapse. Prost had the brake problem and also the engine misfire. Answers on the postcard, please. Beloff was in that same future world champion bracket as Villeneuve, maybe even Von Trips before both of them. There's reports that he'd got a deal in place with Ferrari for 1986 or 1987, but the German would be killed at Spa in 1985. He tried to send it up the inside of Jackie Ix at Eau Rouge, supposedly because he wanted to beat Ix at his home race, as well as the fact that Ix didn't particularly like Beloff. Ix thought Beloff was a bit of a playboy and a bit too sure of himself, taking risks that were just totally unnecessary. After the crash, Ix was able to extract himself from the car and run over to Beloff's that was totally wrecked. He and the safety crews took 10 minutes to get Beloff out, but it was too late to save him. For years, and even today, some people still blame Jackie for that crash. Martin Brundle, Beloff's teammate at Tyrrell, put it down to Beloff going side by side and not lifting, because Beloff wouldn't lift. Beloff's career was very much like Villeneuve's, uh, a massive what if. What if he hadn't tried that move at Eau Rouge? What if he continued with Formula One? Would he have given Senna and Prost a run for their money in the late 1980s? Who knows? A lot of people on that Nürburgring video think that he would have done. Speaking of Jackie X, I've also got on this list, Jackie X. A Jackie X is a driver that often gets slept on. The man is without a doubt a racing legend and has been on the top step in endurance racing, Formula 1 Grand Prix, and also won the Dakar. So this is a man who can wheel, as the kids say. But Formula 1 remains the one that got away from him, and out of all the drivers I've looked at here today, he's the one where I've had to sit down and look at statistics, look at race results, look at the cars he drove, and other bits and pieces like that, because I thought that Jackie X might have been a bit like Giancarlo Fisichella or David Coulthard. Now before I get slammed for comparing someone as legendary as Jackie X to Giancarlo Fisichella or David Coulthard, I'm talking about the fact that he might have been in the right place just at the wrong time. When David Coulthard was at a team capable of winning the championship, his teammate was Mika Hakkinen, and the guy in the other car was Michael Schumacher. In a way, this is similar to Ix's F1 career. Now, eight wins during the killer years of F1 isn't something to turn your nose up at, and while in a previous video I said that Ix wasn't too successful in Formula 1, I mean that he wasn't a champion, and probably should have been. So having a look at his career, he did do a couple of races here and there in 1966 and 1967, but it was 1968 that he debuted full-time with Ferrari. So in 1968, he finished fourth in the standings behind Hill in the overpowered Lotus 49, Stewart and Hulm. But he missed one race and then did not start in Canada because he broke his leg and missed the US Grand Prix as a result. On top of this, he non-finished three times. So by doing those other three races, who knows, he might have finished a bit higher. In 1969, he moved to Brabham and was second overall behind an overpower Jackie Stewart because Stewart would win six of the 11 rounds of that season. Ix would finish on the podium quite often though. Then in 1970, he goes back to Ferrari and reliability scuppers his chances of taking the title as Rint in his Lotus 72 won the championship despite being killed at Monza that year. One less retirement, one fewer retirement, and the five-point gap could have been overhauled. It's the same story in 1969 as it is in 1971. Stewart dominates, but other drivers have arrived on the scene. Peterson, Sever, Fittipaldi. So when Ix came into Formula 1 in 1968, you've got the likes of Hill, Clark, Stewart, McLaren, Rint, and those guys there. Clark would be killed that year, though, so we can probably take him off that little list, but the others are still there. Brabham and Surtees were coming to the end of their careers, but then in 1970, McLaren had been killed, and Hill wasn't quite the same drive after smashing his legs at the previous year's US Grand Prix. In 1971, Stewart is still there, and probably at the peak of his powers, but as mentioned, the likes of Peterson and Sever were coming through. 
So while X might have seemed at first to have been in that little overlap of talent between generations, a bit like Fisichella was, and just to clarify on that, Fisichella was born too late to be in with the likes of Hacken and Schumacher, Coulthard and Villeneuve, and too early to be in with the likes of Button, Raikkonen, and Heidfeld and Alonso. But all of this is just opinion and going based off the entry list, but it really is more his Ferraris just being totally unreliable and things like that. But six wins up Le Mans, a Dakar and a Bathurst 1000. Jackie X is one of the great all-round drivers, if you ask me. And mentioning those latter F1 drivers pulls me finally towards our final case study, Robert Kubica. Now, while Kubica wasn't the first driver from the other side of the Iron Curtain to race in Formula 1, he's the first to have a pole and a win. The first pole on pole at Bahrain in his BMW Sauber, as was. He then won the 2008 Canadian Grand Prix the year after shunting heavily in the previous year, which also had a first win at the end of it, coincidentally. But anyway, that win in 2008 briefly put Bobby K at the top of the Drivers' Championship standings. But then it sort of fell apart. Development on the car stopped as Sauber and BMW or somebody in management said, yeah, we won't bother doing much with this car now. We'll focus on the new 2009 regulations that might be more worth our time. Oh dear, there's been a market crash. We'd better be more frugal with our spending despite being BMW who make yes money a year. The rest of the season was between Hamilton and Massa as they fought for the World Championship, while Kubica ended up finishing the season with the same amount of points as Raikkonen, but was the lower class of the two drivers. During 2009, the BMW was... Well, it was crap. Heidfeld and Kubica would finish on 19 and 17 points respectively, and then BMW would pull out of the Sauber operation. But a move to Renault for 2010 might serve as an opportunity to move back up. I mean, it sort of did. The Renault was a mid-grid car and Kubica finished 8th overall, with rumours going around that he was going to join Ferrari in around 2012 to replace Felipe Massa, who was now out of sorts, and really not the same driver that he was before his near-fatal accident at Hungary in 2009. Then Kubica had a near-fatal accident of his own. In the off-season in 2011, Kubica was rallying in an event in Andorra when he slid off the road and crashed, resulting in, among other injuries, a partial amputation of his right arm. The rallying is dangerous, and the guys who do it are crazy. I saw a crash yesterday, and it's a reminder of what can happen when it goes wrong. Seriously, it's mad. Link to that video in the description. Now, while Kubica has made a comeback to Formula 1 with Williams, he is nowhere near that same driver, and he remains the modern what-if. But who knows? Maybe some future racing historian will come along in 20 years and add Russell, Leclerc, or Piastri to this list. But anyway, I've taken up far too much of your time here today, so this has been a video on F1's nearly men, or just F1's what-if men. If it's something that you've been interested by, or you want to discuss this further, then do leave anything that you might think about these particular drivers in the comment section underneath this video so you can get that discussion going and leave who else is a nearly man or also one of the, the great what ifs. But if you liked it, then give it a thumb up and if you want to see anything else to do around here, get that Stefan Bell on, the Jean-Christophe Belly on or the Derek Bell on and yeah, you'll never miss out on anything I do around here. Massive thanks as always to these legends over at Patreon and if you want to help out with the image purchases or in general keep things running around here then links to that and my socials along with Matt's Twitter and that rally crash will be in the description box for you. Or there's super thanks for those who just want to give me a small tip. So until next time I've been Aidan Millward, have a cracking day wherever you are and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.